into another state, you run into a situation of certain indemnity statutes within those states. Uh, some states afford broad form indemnity, allowing you to transfer all risk, plus the sole negligence of the other party. See, never indemnify from and against its own fault or stupidity. You have, you have intermediate indemnity and you have limited form indemnity. Intermediate allows you to transfer your liability to another party uh, for everything except sole negligence. You have, you have limited form which only allows you to transfer indemnity for the percentage of fault that you had. Let's leave that alone and we'll go from indemnity agreements because I think Andy pretty much covered that in, the, uh, in, the, in his, in his uh, presentation. We have another way of transferring some risk and that is via additional insured endorsements. In other words, as a general contractor, we want to receive a certificate of insurance from our subcontractors because we want to transfer the risk down. Ideally, ideally what occurs in a, contractual, in a contractual situation is that you have what's known as neutral transfer. In other words, you are transferring down to your subcontractor, what you're transferring down to them mirrors what you are being trans, what the owner is transferring to you. Uh, the, way of, the way of doing that is to have a subcontractor give you an additional insured endorsement, a certificate of insurance. It's imperative to understand what you are getting from that subcontractor when he is providing you an additional insured endorsement. Additional insured endorsements over the last 15 to 20 years have undergone numerous changes. The first one, the one that is commonly, commonly related to in many construction projects or in many construction contracts, is the 2010-1185 endorsement. That provided coverage for premises and operations coverage. It provided coverage for completed operations. It included coverage for the negligence, for the sole negligence of the additional insured. These additional insured endorsements have undergone changes over the year. Over the years, in 1993, there was another additional insured endorsement that came out that did not provide products and completed operations coverage, additional insurance for products and completed operations. That was deemed unacceptable by the construction industry, and rightfully so. So in 2010, another endorsement came out. That was the CG 2010-01. That was a 2001 endorsement. That endorsement provided coverage for premises operations. It also provided coverage for the sole negligence of the additional insured. It did not, however, provide additional insured, an additional insured status for products and completed operations. That had to be done on a separate endorsement called the 2037. Additional insured endorsements wasn't what your contracts required for. It wasn't, was not what your contracts required. The newest endorsement out is the CG 2010-704 endorsement. It includes premises operations. It does not include products and completed operations. That has to be written on the 2037. And this time, it maybe it may be not, and Andy's going to be the one to answer that, I don't believe that it provides coverage for the sole negligence of the additional insured. And typically, that's what the contract that you're getting from the owner is requiring. Okay? Another way of providing coverage is under a blanket additional insured endorsement. Uh, that, does not, that means that there does not have to be a specific project or a specific owner named on that blanket additional insured endorsement. Please be careful. This is my word of warning. Blanket additional insured endorsements. In almost 100% of the cases, and I know of only one company that, that it is not the case, require that there be a contractual requirement that you are named as an additional insured. I've given you a packet, and if you go into that, you'll see, you will see an endorsement called the additional insured Owners, lessees, contractors, automatic status when required in construction agreement with you. 
There's no oral contract here. There's no purchase order without a requirement that they name you as an additional insured. You have got to have an actual subcontract agreement or at least an agreement requiring that they name you as an additional insured. Touching on what Andy had said, I call it the certificate of insurance fallacy, okay? An insurance certificate, and again, I have included two copies of insurance certificates. One is the most recent revision of the certificate of insurance of the Accord certificate. The one is the prior. Insurance certificates read that it is an informational purpose item. Uh, we have a particular engineering firm that, that uh, Andy and I have dealt with in the past that have often said, well, this, we want you to attest that this policy, in fact, covers this and this and this under the, and under the engineering agreement that we so state, and it covers patent infringement, it covers pollution, it covers, it, it, crosses, it, it crosses the boundary between insurance and surety bonds, okay? Simply, we can't do it. If I, in fact, put that on a certificate of insurance and give that to an owner, and we have a loss that occurs, probably my next visit is going to be with Mr. Natali explaining how I could have done something as stupid as that, is to put that on a certificate of insurance. What you see is not necessarily what you get when you get a certificate of insurance. When you ask for the certificate of insurance, ask for the additional insured forms. See what they're in fact providing you. See if it matches up with what your contractual requirements are. Ask for the primary endorsement, showing that the subcontractor's insurance is, is in fact primary to yours. One of the questions originally was the differential between the two additional insured forms. Previously, the cancellation clause said, we, the insurance company agrees or, or endeavor, will endeavor to mail 30 days, there was a blank, number of days cancellation to the, to the party shown below. Uh, that form is now gone. The new additional or the, the, the new cancellation clause of the policy reads simply, should any of the above described policies be canceled before the expiration date thereof, notice will be delivered in accordance with the policy provisions. The only way of changing the cancellation clause within the policy is to issue a material change endorsement. Uh, we issue a material change endorsement. What our standard is at this point in time, if we're issuing a specific requirement for cancellation, we are issuing the certificate of insurance with that verbiage on there and with a copy of our material change endorsement applicable to that particular insurance company. Some companies absolutely will not vary from 10, days, from 10 days notice of cancellation. You have to be aware of that. Some companies will give you 30 days notice, except in the event of non-payment, which is a state law. It's 10 days notice of cancellation. So as Andy said, typically we cannot give you what you need. By law, we can't give that to you. Does it include an indemnity agreement? Does it include a hold harmless agreement? Does it specify an additional insured endorsement? And which endorsement is it specifying? Is it outmoded? I have one contractor who still requires the 2010-1185. It's not really an available endorsement anymore. Make sure it's updated a little bit. Um, does it require that the subcontractor's policy is primary? Is there a requirement that in the event of a 30-day notice of cancellation that there is a material change endorsement provided with that certificate of insurance. Is there a requirement of specific coverages and limits equal to your own? Is there a requirement of per project aggregate? I've given you a little book, uh, the yellow one, that, that's kind of a good Bible from the, from, the stand, from the standpoint of risk transfer. It may be a little bit outmoded in some areas, but it's still a good outline for what you should be looking for in your subcontract agreements and applying some of those thoughts to it. It's amazing how many subcontract agreements I do see that, are, that don't specify amount of insurance, that don't specify notice of cancellation, that don't specify, that just say, 
uh, you'll, you'll provide an additional insured endorsement without any notification that in fact the additional insured endorsement has to provide not only premises operations but products and completed operations as well. We can assure you that the owner is going to require that of you. And secondly, and Andy, this is where you get, you know, we split the commission. When is the last time your attorney has reviewed your subcontract agreement? More than likely, probably not for three or four years. And there are definite differentials in what is available out there. And really, when's the last time your insurance agent has reviewed your subcontract agreement? There are certain things we can point out, differentials in additional insured forms. The future, potentially, is vertical risk transfer. At this point in time, I know of one state, I believe uh, New Jersey, has upheld, Andy, are you aware of it, vertical risk transfer. Uh, I, believe, I believe it's being discussed in a number of states. The differential with vertical risk transfer is compared to horizontal risk transfer. At this point in time, the subcontractor, you've transferred the risk down to the subcontractor, the subcontractor has a claim, he exhausts his primary liability policy. Your policy then steps in, you exhaust your limits, then we go back to the subcontractor's policy if he has excess, he'll exhaust his limits. It then goes back to you, you exhaust your limits. First of all, you have to be, you have to be in a state that is going to accept the concept of vertical risk transfer. The policy die or the con the contractual documents have to state that there is going to be vertical risk transfer. The policies, the other insurance clauses of the various policies, have to be adjusted to reflect that there is vertical risk transfer. Uh, Andy's one to better comment on how that stuff goes through states. As far as I know, at this point in time, Ohio still sticks to the to the horizontal. To the, to the horizontal exhaustion. It, but so did New Jersey up until about a year ago, and then all of a sudden they looked at it and they said, well, we kind of like the idea of this. And, and there was a case that went through, I believe it was actually two years ago, where they agreed to a, or where they agreed to a vertical risk transfer. My feeling is it's probably the wave of the future. And finally, contractors beware. It's long been understood that faulty work performed by a subcontractor which results in property damage to the policyholder's work has been a covered claim. We've always felt that, we were comfortable with that. More and more states are now changing that view. I believe there are 17 states at this point in time that uh, the case has trended toward faulty workmanship not being a covered claim. And in nine states, the case law at this point in time is limited or inconclusive. Many of the large carriers, national carriers, and some of the regional carriers are now providing an endorsement, naturally for an additional charge, okay, that specifically states that, in fact, that scenario of subcontractor default workmanship to your, to your resulting in new property damage to your product is covered. It varies from carrier to carrier based on cost. It also varies from carrier to carrier based on the extent of coverage that they're offering. I'm not here to tell you who's doing it, who's not doing it, and what to look out for, but it is an area that you should check with your insurance agent discuss it with them, see if it's needed, and from that standpoint, keep in mind that you guys are traveling, you may end up in a state doing a job somewhere, okay, where that is not considered a covered scenario. Uh, we were kind of discussing it at the office and we kind of get a chuckle that, that the insurance companies for years have, have viewed that as a covered claim once some of the states started saying, oh, well, you know, hey, we're not sure, we don't think construction defect coverage is, is, is covered. The grant of coverage has always been there. Why we find it necessary at this point in time to step back and charge a premium for, may, for maybe some state that, that is not considered covered in kind of cracks us up anymore, but that's the nature of the insurance business.